It's September 4th, 1975. The Sinai Interim Agreement is signed. Welsh actor Kai Owen is born. And on television, the very first episode of Space 1999 airs. Welcome to That 70s Review. Hello fellow time travelers and welcome to That 70s Review, where we look at shows that we loved as kids and which you're coming to love as adults to see if they hold up. And this time we're looking at Space 1999, the first season anyway. And starting with this episode, I'm going to be doing these reviews slightly differently. Rather than looking at every single episode of every single season, which, to be frank, takes forever to do, I'll instead give you the usual background on the show, some strengths and weaknesses of it, and then give you three must-watch episodes and three must-avoid episodes before giving you the overall rating for the show or the season in total. Because really, if I'm looking at every single episode for you, then doesn't that kind of take the fun out of watching the show for yourself? As for why I'm only covering season one of Space 1999 this time, that's because more than anything else that I've covered so far, more than Wonder Woman when it changed networks, more than Buck Rogers when it changed after an actor's strike in 1980, more even than Battlestar Galactica and Galactica 1980 when it changed from an enjoyable show to a stinking pile of shit. The two seasons of Space 1999 are different. Very, very different. I have to admit though, no matter what negative things I may say about this show, and trust me, there are a few things to say, I adored it when I was a kid living in Flint, Michigan and I still have a soft spot for it now. From what I can remember, we were able to catch the signal from across the lake in Ontario when the show aired on Canadian TV. Yes, I watched this show as a kid. A show that has scenes like this. Explains a lot, doesn't it? There were also records, and specifically book and record sets, of this show, produced for kids my age by the legendary New Jersey-based company Peter Pan Records through their Power Records imprint. Trust me, if you mention Power Records to sci-fi fans or comic book fans of a certain age, you'll see their faces light right up. Again, though, the show that produced scenes like this... was adapted into records for kids. For kids. And yet we loved it, because kids can handle this sort of thing better than adults can. And presumably nobody knew this better than Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. The husband and wife team were well-known producers of popular children's television in the UK in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. They pioneered innovative techniques in puppeteering, which they called Super Marionation. Yeah, that sounds like it really should have some exclamation marks after it, doesn't it? (coughs) Using this technique, they produced some of the most iconic children's adventure series, such as Supercar, Stingray, Thunderbirds, and my personal favorite, the scariest series featuring puppets ever produced for kids, well, apart from H.R. Puff and stuff, Captain Scarlet and the Misterons. This is the voice of the Mr. Ons. We know that you can hear us, Earthmen. Jesus, that's creepy. But by the late 60s, Super Marionation was losing its appeal, and marionettes like this wouldn't be used quite so extensively for a show or movie again, for kids or otherwise, at least not until the South Park guys got hold of them. Yeah, that's definitely otherwise. By 1969, the Andersons had moved into live action because Jerry in particular wanted to do movies someday. They produced a show called UFO, which followed the adventures of Shadow, an organization based on the moon committed to fighting off aliens. 
The show starred Ed Bishop as the occasionally insane Commander Straker. Actually, occasionally insane Commander seems to be a trope for the Andersons. <laughs> Okay, okay, I kid, because Koenig's not actually insane there, but he does get pretty intense sometimes. The first season of UFO initially did fairly well in the ratings, both here and in the UK, but by the time Jerry Anderson proposed a second season of UFO, set in the far-flung future year of 1999, the ratings on UFO had tanked, and ITC the entertainment conglomerate overseeing the show in both countries wanted nothing more to do with a show with UFO in the title. They also didn't want a show that had any episodes set on Earth, because Abe Mandel, the ITC rep in New York, had hated an episode of UFO in which the son of a main character dies because he felt sci-fi shows shouldn't be domestic. He knew he's been a kill. That's a destroyer. I couldn't stop that. I should have been able to stop them. I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't good enough. I should have been able to stop them. I should have. I should. Kind of shows what little he knew. Mandel wouldn't commission a new show unless Jerry Anderson could guarantee that it would have no episode set on Earth. Possibly half-jokingly, Jerry Anderson proposed opening the new series by blowing up the Earth. When Mandel suggested, probably correctly for once, that that just might be off-putting to audiences, Anderson then suggested they blow up the moon. Somehow that got reworked into the premise we ended up getting, and thus Space 1999 was born. Space 1999 was the most expensive TV show ever produced for British television up to that point, about $24 million in 2021 dollars, and there are many reasons why. One was the extensive model work and full-size props used for the special effects, especially the moon base Alpha model, and the main spacecraft for the show, the Eagle. These still look amazing, by the way. Special effects supervisor Brian Johnson had worked on 2001 A Space Odyssey, and the show looked so similar to that movie that Stanley Kubrick himself actually threatened to sue over it. Seems to be a trend with this kind of show, doesn't it? A huge amount of money also went into building the impressive sets, such as the vast main mission set used throughout Season 1, and to pay for the unisex uniforms produced by fashion designer Rudy Gernreich a personal friend of Barbara Bain's. Everything was big on this show. Big sets, big ships, big pants bottoms. Sure, these uniforms may look a bit drab and outdated now, but to many, these costumes are every bit as iconic as the uniforms from Star Trek have become. For that matter, even Star Trek would end up with similar uniforms by the end of the decade in its first outing on the big screen, but it eventually got better. All of this, of course, cost a mint. Another major cost was the casting. To ensure high US viewing figures, ITV president Sir Lou Grade wanted American actors for the two lead characters, Commander John Koenig and Dr. Helena Russell. To that end, he insisted that the Andersons hire another husband and wife team, Martin Landau and Barbara Bain, who had worked together on the long-running American series Mission Impossible, and the Landau Bains likely didn't come cheap. Rounding out the cast were fugitive star Barry Morse as Professor Victor Bergman, Australian actor Nick Tate as pilot Alan Carter, Xenia Merton as analyst Sandra Bennis, Prentice Hancock as second-in-command Paul Morrow, Clifton Jones as computer specialist David Cano, and finally Anton Phillips as Dr. Matthias. At its best, Space 1999 still looks and sounds amazing, especially that opening. Seriously, listen to this.
And yes, they showed snippets from that week's episode in every opening, much as another and somewhat more highly regarded series would later do. Times the first season of Space 1999 tries to do what Trek did a few years before it, by mixing good old-fashioned sci-fi action and adventure with exploration of such philosophical concepts as the nature of time and space themselves. Mind you, it doesn't always stick the landing. But unlike shows like Buck Rogers, which are about nothing but the action and adventure, it at least gives it the old college try. As for the acting, most of the cast is often extremely good, given the material they're working with, and more on that in a minute. Martin Landau isn't yet giving an Oscar-worthy performance. I have no home. Haunted. Despised. Living like an animal. But he's at least providing us with a strong lead character who's hard to take your eyes off of, especially when he's shouting, and he does a lot of shouting. Now listen to me! You're in danger! The Guardian is taking over your mind! Come on! Victor, listen to me! Remember what I said about crazy commanders? <laughs> and I've just got to say, I adore Barry Morse as Professor Victor Bergman. He always comes off as someone both amused and bemused by all the various things he and the crew end up going through, as if he's going to burst out laughing at any moment, which probably wasn't too far from the truth. Speaking of actors I love to pieces, Nick Tate is always worth looking at. He makes Alan Carter the season's breakout character, leading to Tate getting more fan mail than just about anyone, including, much to his chagrin, Martin Landau. That's Martin Landau's chagrin, I mean, not Nick Tate's. And yes, he's another one of my childhood crushes. What can I say? I was a horny little bugger. But seriously, look at him. Also, Xenia Merton, when her character Sandra is used properly, gives this show the sort of emotional center it's sometimes frankly lacking. And while they're not always used to their best potential, both Clifton Jones and Anton Phillips are valuable players in a cast that's almost as diverse as the one on Star Trek just a few years previously. Oh, and did I mention the special effects? Yeah, they're really, really good. Most of the time. On top of that, this first season boasts an impressive roster of guest stars, a veritable who's who of British cinema and TV, including Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, the great Margaret Layton in her last performance, future Lovejoy star Ian McShane looking very young and very cute, and even, in a memorable episode, Brian Blessed! There's also a young actress in the episode The Guardian of Peary named Catherine Schell, who's so good in an otherwise not-so-good episode, you'd think the producers would have to hire her again for something, right? Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> More about her next time. Actually, speaking of Guardian of Peary, I rather like this episode. Not for the effects, which fall into the not-so-great category for once, but for other reasons. Yeah, lots of other reasons. <clears throat> Unfortunately, decent acting, good special effects, and hairy chests aren't always enough to carry a show, and this one does have its deficits. Alpha Team in danger! Code Red! This is Space 1999, Eagle One Spaceship. Off of control, we have contact. You can jettison the cockpit and engines, then link them up. It's Mini Eagle One in visual contact. Off of control, hookup is a go. And their Eagle One rescue phase is complete. Eagle One, Roger and L. Space 1999, Eagle One Spaceship comes with three inch figures. Assembly required, you from Mattel. 
For all of the action and adventure this show is often capable of, a big criticism of it is that the pacing, even for the 1970s, is hideously, horribly slow. And that's odd, given the number of episodes that end on a note that leaves the story feeling unfinished, which unfortunately happens more often than it should. Those freeze frames at the end of every episode probably don't help much either. How could anyone possibly know that a planet on a collision course would not collide? Would simply touch? I mean, really, doesn't she look like she's about to say something else? Also, as I said earlier, this show is directly inspired by 2001, and just like the Kubrick movie, it tries to go to some pretty trippy places in these first 24 episodes. Unlike the Kubrick movie, however, it doesn't always get where it intended to go. I can hear your thoughts. Yes. In eternity, I have no hurry. I think a thought, perhaps, in every thousand of your years. You are never there to hear it. Are you God? It was good to have known you. Wait. That leads to several episodes that only hint that there's something else going on. Something that caused the moon to leave Earth's orbit without coming out and saying it. We have expected you. For many millions of years. You see, your destiny has always been our destiny. But how can that be possible? It was only a matter of time before we met John Koenig. Yeah, there's quite a bit of that sort of thing. This ends up leaving the viewer to have to try to fill in the blanks. And trust me, there are plenty of books comics, and fan-produced films that attempt to do just that. In fact, they kind of have to, especially given the changes between season one and season two, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. Another problem with the series is that there's no sense at times that events in one episode are at all connected to any of the others, and that's entirely the fault of both the stations that aired the show and ITC itself. The episodes were filmed with the intention of showing them in a specific order, but in the U.S., the show was sold to individual markets rather than to one of the three major networks, because they all passed on it. So the episodes were shown completely out of order. For instance, in some U.S. markets, Dragon's Domain, which was the 23rd episode filmed, was shown directly after Breakaway, the series pilot. This sort of thing happened in the U.K. as well. As a result, the romance that develops slowly between Koenig and Helena ends up feeling like it comes out of nowhere, blowing hot one week and cold the next. A similar romance between Paul and Sandra seems to come and go like a summer breeze, and seemingly all in the span of a single episode. This leads to an almost negative continuity, although this was admittedly an era where continuity as we currently know it wasn't as major a concern. But it doesn't help that whenever someone does give a date in a particular episode, it simply doesn't match up to anything before it or after it. It was the 877th day since our moon left Earth. That sets this episode in February 2002, and if it aired a few weeks after the moon got shot out of orbit on September 13th, 1999, you can see where a viewer just might get confused. Commander, it's impossible. On top of all of this, there was endless executive meddling by the ITV suits in New York, who insisted on vetting every script before and during production, asking for more of an emphasis on action one week, then asking for more cerebral content the next, and so on. As a result, what little connective tissue there is between episodes that's actually there is pretty hard to get at, even if you do watch the episodes in the right order. And, by the way, this was my second time through this season, and this time I did watch them in production order. You can find the production order on Wikipedia, but I've gone ahead and listed it below. Trust me, it makes a huge difference. And you're welcome. 
And yeah, some people criticize the mandated inclusion in later episodes of Italian guest stars, some of whom have some real trouble with English. This is because ITV got Italian network RAI to co-produce the show, but by and large, they're really not that bad. If a man with a red coat and white beard drove into town, he'd be arrested, certified. Unbelievable. And that's what you are going to do with me and my monster, right? Yeah, I've seen worse performances than that. In fact, the performance that gets the lion's share of negative criticism, and often rightfully so, is that of one of the leads. By the time she appeared on Space 1999, Barbara Bain, a former student of no less than Lee Strasberg, had already won three consecutive Primetime Emmys, the first actress ever to do so for Mission Impossible, as well as a Golden Globe nomination back when that still meant something. As an actress, Barbara Bain knew and still knows what she's doing. So it's a constant surprise that Dr. Helena Russell, who should be the emotional center of this show, is often the most wooden and unemotive character on screen. Now seriously, does this look like a woman who's horrified to you? Now, watching the episodes in production order does mitigate this a great deal, since Bane starts giving more emotive performances as the season progresses, and by the time we get to season two, the producers have obviously had a quiet word or two with her about this. <coughs> but watching these episodes in the order they aired results in a character who's human one week and a frosty cipher the next. Reportedly, Bane herself was somewhat frosty to the other actors on set, at least when they were actually acting. Bane was so difficult for the other actors to work with, whether it was not giving them enough emotion back in a scene, or insisting that the costumes of other actresses never be more flattering than hers, that she had the nickname of Barbara Payne. While both she and Landau were described as very Hollywood by the production team, she was said to be the worst of the two. Landau himself could also be difficult, but in other ways, insisting that every command decision had to come from his character alone. I'll talk about what he ended up doing to Nick Tate to keep Alan Carter from getting too much attention later on. But for the most part, Landau was seemingly interested in making his character consistent. And that's necessary because that's another deficit in this show. The Andersons and the writing staff just aren't interested in giving their characters any, well, character. In the book Cult TV, The Golden Age of ITC, written by Robert Sellers, Barry Morse recounts meeting with Jerry and Sylvia Anderson before the series started shooting, and having them go on and on about the sets, the models, the costumes, at which point Morse said, Before we get into all this about the glory of the uniforms, could we spend perhaps a minute or two talking about who we are? So Morse did what any good actor worth his salt does in situations like this. He came up with his own backstory. But in this case, for such a major lead character, shouldn't there have been one to begin with? And before anyone mentions the episode in which he gets some backstory, that episode was made towards the end of the season. So it doesn't quite count the same way as, say, a backstory written by the series creators for a series Bible would count. Finally, there's what some people find to be the biggest stumbling block, which is the basic premise. And for that, we need to talk about the pilot episode, Breakaway. Now, before I go any further, I do have to say that I adore this episode, mainly because this is one of the episodes that I encountered as a book and record set as a kid, long before I ever saw the actual episode. It really is an exciting story, but it's also one that doesn't make a lick of sense. <coughs> In Breakaway, Commander John Koenig is returning to Moonbase Alpha, where he used to be commander, to oversee the Metaprobe, a manned deep space mission to a rogue planet that has entered the solar system, a rogue planet that has atmosphere and signs of life. He's being sent there by Space Commissioner Simmons, who says the mission must succeed at all costs. 
but at the rate they're going, it's not going to succeed, because several of the astronauts assigned to the mission have gone crazy and then died from some unknown radiation sickness, even though there is no radiation according to both Bergman and Dr. Helena Russell. But the dark side of the moon has become a dump for radioactive waste from Earth, and not only is it causing the sickness, it's getting ready to explode. Which it does. And when it does, it hurdles the moon out of Earth's orbit, and eventually out of the solar system, where it travels from star system to star system, fast enough to go from star system to star system, but somehow slow enough for the Alphans to go to planets in those systems and come back, etc., etc. Yeah, you can kind of see the problem. And it's this premise that tends to put off people who would otherwise like the show from actually watching it. And you can't really blame them. After all, no less than Isaac Asimov himself wrote an article for TV Guide pointing out that any explosion big enough to send the moon out of orbit would destroy it first. And if the moon did happen to survive, since the explosion happens on the dark side of the moon, the moon would rocket straight into Earth itself. So, yeah. But Jerry and Sylvia Anderson pointed out that other sci-fi shows got the benefit of suspension of disbelief, so why shouldn't they? And really, they've got a point. After all, isn't a show about a starship that can travel several times faster than the speed of light, where the crew can have every single atom in their bodies deconstructed and then reconstructed on the planet's surface without killing them or worse, just a little hard to believe in? Yeah, 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 I know, I know, sometimes it does kill them, but you see what I'm getting at. However, if you can suspend your disbelief enough to believe that the entire moon can go Star Trekking across the universe, then Space 1999 has a lot to offer. Anybody interested in the show must watch Breakaway, if only for the experience. And there are a few other episodes that you definitely must watch. I honestly don't want to say too much about this one, except that it features Moonbase Alpha going through the Anomaly of the Week and somehow being split into two, one in our timeline and the other projected into the past. This week's co-star, British Scream Queen Judy Geeson, is the only one trapped between the two for some reason. Without giving too much away, this one is both satisfying and well acted, with the off-the-line Barbara Bain giving a strong performance as not just one, but two versions of Dr. Russell. Like most Space 1999 episodes, though, it's not the most cheery story. But it does give us a tantalizing view of what could happen to this crew along the way, or rather, what did happen to this crew along the way. It's definitely worth looking at. Mission of the Darians involves the Alphans visiting a vast city ship in space after receiving a distress call that's hundreds of years old. Emergency! Emergency! This is the commander of the spaceship Daria. The people on board the Daria are divided into two groups. The survivors, a tribe of nearly barbaric humans led by no less than Aubrey Morris from A Clockwork Orange, among other things, and a smaller group of elites whose leaders include, of all people, Joan Collins, a few years removed from her appearance on Star Trek. Both groups are obsessed with genetic purity, albeit for different reasons, which has led them down a pretty terrifying path, to put it mildly. You'll have to watch the episode to see exactly what I mean. I have a few reasons for loving this one. For one thing, it was one of the four episodes adapted by Power Records, so I knew this story long before ever seeing it. For another, it has some impressively strong direction, giving us scenes such as this one.
I don't want to show you the others because I don't want to spoil anything, but believe me, Power Records reproduced all of this. So, yeah. Sweet dreams, kids! And while the show does have a decent musical score most of the time, it tends to reuse the same cues over and over again. But for this episode, they hired legendary composer Frank Cordell, who composed a piece called The White Mountain, to represent the Darien ship, and it's just stunning. Moody and atmospheric, just what the show does best. I so wish this music had been on that Power Records version. Oh yeah, Doctor Who's Louise Jameson is in there somewhere as one of the survivors, in an early part for her, though I frankly haven't been able to find her, and believe me, I've looked. Not only does this one have some truly poignant scenes, bringing home just how much danger the Alphans are in on a daily basis, it also gives us another glimpse at what their future could be if they should happen to go down the wrong path. It really is a standout episode. And finally, we get to my favorite episode of the first season, another one that was adapted by Power Records. I can't believe they ever actually saw the episode, because if they had, they might have chosen something a little less nightmare-fueling. Trust me, I am so glad I didn't see this one as a kid. The audio version was hard enough. In this one, we find out that one of the Alphans, Tony Cellini, played by the best of the Italian co-stars, Johnny Garco. No, Johnny Garco. Was the only survivor of a traumatic space mission years before, one which both Koenig and Bergman oversaw. Now the moon is on course with the ship he left behind, and the nightmare he encountered there endangers them all. In addition to some long overdue backstory for all three of our main characters, this one dives into outright science fiction horror, and after watching it, you may never look at an open door the same way again, because the monster essentially is just... oh, you get it. While I love this one to pieces, this is the episode where Martin Landau demanded that the central plot, which was meant to center on Alan Carter, be shifted to the Italian guest star of the week, just so Nick Tate wouldn't be given so much of a focus in addition to all of the fan mail. What's that guy got against me? It's really a pity that Martin Landau had to object to Carter being the main character here instead of Tony Bellini. It is the year 2002, the 877th day since the moon left Earth's orbit and began its epic journey into the great void of intergalactic space. Astronaut Tony Bellini lies unconscious in the medical center, attended by Dr. Helena Russell. And giving Nick Tate this acting opportunity would have been amazing. And seriously, I could go on with this list. I haven't even mentioned Death's Other Domain, the one starring Brian Blessed. Power Records did that one, too. And when you watch that episode, you'll wonder what they were thinking when they were adapting that for kids. There's also The Last Sunset, in which the Alphans get a few days of oxygen and sunshine on the moon's surface, and Paul and Sandra's romance gets a brief but fiery half-life. And The Testament of Arcadia, in which we discover what has happened before will happen again. Or however it was that Balstar Galactica said it when they ripped it off in the early 2000s. And there are quite a few others worth watching, but if you want to dip your toes in the water first to see if the show is worth it for you, go for the first three that I mentioned. Of course, you take the good, you take the bad. Take them both and there you have the facts of life. The oh, facts stop it. And while this first season hasn't got any episodes that are completely unwatchable, it does have some that I wouldn't say you must avoid, but you can certainly skip. So I'll spoil them for you here. Trust me, you'll thank me later. This one starts off promisingly enough, 
with the first child being born on Moonbase Alpha and within minutes beginning to age at an alarming rate. The child seems to like everybody except Koenig, who's suspicious of him, and since Koenig is always right, it turns out there's reason to be suspicious, since the boy's body has been taken over by a formless alien refugee, whose mate then takes over the mother's body, and... Oh, gross. This episode wastes the talents of guest star Julian Glover, better known to some audiences from Game of Thrones, and it requires the Alphans to carry the idiot ball for a while. I mean, why would they think that this kid would grow up to look like this in these clothes? Shouldn't that just scream alien possession? But things work out in the end. The aliens are defeated somehow. Both mother and child are eventually returned to normal, we hope with no memories of them having made out, and we never hear about them again. Even when these episodes are watched in order, there's no reference in any future episode to the fact that the moon now has a baby on board, and you'd think there would be. That's a pretty big thing. But the show's allergy to continuity means that secondary characters like this just don't matter much. It would be as if Naomi Wildman were born on an episode of Star Trek Voyager, and then we never saw her for the rest of the series. Which, by the way, didn't happen. In fact, secondary characters matter so little in this show, it's probably why we get a character we've never seen before suddenly showing up as part of the regular cast in Season 2, but... Again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, I kind of like this one, and this one actually has some watchable moments, but even I wouldn't put it on the list of the best episodes. In the full circle, the Alphans travel to a planet, and the group of them, including Koenig and Helena, mysteriously disappear. Then the rest of the crew are attacked by Stone Age-era-looking humanoids, one of whom kidnaps Sandra. And guess who they all turn out to be? Yeah, don't ask me to explain. Even the episode can't explain it. In short, this whole exercise is just an excuse to get Sandra into this Raquel Welch outfit for most of the episode, even though it does give Martin Landau and Barbara Bain a chance to do some major method acting. In fact, there's a story that Landau and Bain's daughter brought friends home to meet her mother, only to find her preparing for this episode by shrieking in front of a mirror in her animal skins. Oh, Mom, stop it! You're embarrassing me! In short, this one has its moments, but it's by no means a great episode. And then we get Space Brain. Oh, Space Brain. This one is particularly frustrating because it starts off so well. After alien glyphs appear on Alpha's computers, an eagle is lost after being sent to explore an energy field in the moon's path. It's returned to the moon after being crushed into a sphere, pilots and all. Disturbing, but not bad so far. And by the way, counting the number of eagles they lose this season and next, despite presumably having finite sources to build more, is a bit like counting the number of photon torpedoes they use up on Star Trek Voyager. It's fun for a minute, but then it gets so sad so quickly. And speaking of getting so sad so quickly, when Carter and another pilot named Kelly, played by Shane Rimmer, attempt a second mission, Kelly comes back seemingly possessed by the alien creature they now call the Space Brain, which seems intent on taking over the moon base. Turns out the Space Brain knows that it's on a collision course with Alpha and is trying to make sure that they both survive. And the only way for Alpha to survive is to open up the moon base, to equalize the pressure or something, and let all of this Space Brain matter in which looks remarkably like foam, because that's actually what it is.
and no, that's not me putting silly music in. They actually went with Mars Bringer of War for these scenes because nothing says Mars Bringer of War like foam. This one sounds like it was a kick to make, and it's actually fun to watch, though not for the reasons the showmakers likely intended. I mean, really. No wonder one of the writers quit the show because of this episode. The rest of the season has plenty of watchable episodes, as well as some that are less watchable for a number of reasons. <laughs> But how does this first season rate? I'd give it 3.5 out of 5 eagles. This show, and specifically this season, still has a strong following, and it's not without reason. There's so much here that's good, or at least has the potential to be good, despite all of the many obstacles and contradictory demands that ITC placed in its way. The lead actors are decent. Well, most of them, anyway, albeit not consistently so. The special effects are pretty amazing even now, especially when there's no film involved. And many of the scripts are aiming for the same lofty goals as 2001 Space Odyssey, even if they don't always hit the target. If you're expecting a show with reasonable levels of character development, some semblance of continuity, and a fast pace, this ain't the show for you. But... If you go into this season with the right expectations, and watch the episodes in the right order, it's possible to enjoy Space 1999 just as much as you might enjoy original Star Trek. Maybe even more so at times. Brain and Brain! What is Brain? Unfortunately, the suits at ITC weren't so forgiving or generous. And it didn't help matters that Jerry and Sylvia Anderson's marriage was falling apart. Producing this show together proved to be one of the last nails in the coffin. At one point, after he'd already hired a new producer to replace Sylvia Anderson, ITC president Sir Lou Grade abruptly cancelled production of the second season because of his disappointment in the U.S. ratings, and he had to be talked out of it by, among others, that new producer. The new producer was an American, hired specifically to keep the scripts from having to be approved by the head office in New York all the time. Problem is, the man they hired to produce their second and ultimately last season was also the man who'd produced the third and ultimately last season of Star Trek, Fred Freiberger. Brain and Brain, what is Brain? You see what I did there? And that was just one of many changes, either controversial or just plain bad, that led to Space 1999 Season 2. But more about that next time. And that's it for this edition of That 70s Review. Next time we'll look at the second season of Space 1999. In the meantime, if you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, do that thing with the bell that you do so well. And tell me in the comments what shows from the 1970s that you would like me to cover. Till next time, stay safe and stay groovy.